we are conscious of the fact that our class, and particularly the new generation, will be most affected, affected by this crisis. But at the same time, it's broken the logjam, of the ideological logjam of the last 30 years, as a matter of fact, and will compel working class people to move into action. Go no further than over the water in Ireland. From the Celtic Tiger to Bob the Builder in the course of the last year. That's the building industry in, the, in, in Ireland at the present time. With the mass demonstrations, two major mass demonstrations, and a looming general strike in Ireland, that's if the, the, the taking in leaders do not derail that strike at the present time. Look at the immense movement of the French workers in the course of that strike in January. And again, a threatened general strike in the course of this month. But again, the trade union leaders, more frightened than supposing, trying to derail this movement at the present time. Of the upheavals, not only in France, but in Guadeloupe, in Martinique, even touching the Latin American mainland in Guyana, in Dutch Guyana itself. By the way, that's a little, if you like, glimpse and what we used to refer to as the domino theory, which is really the Leon Trotsky's idea of the permanent revolution of the way in this globalized world. Once there's a break in a significant country of capitalism, it will spread like a prairie fire, not just throughout the continent, but throughout the world, particularly in the explosion period that we're going into. Last but not least, we see the social explosion that impends in China, especially in this period where the economy is grinding to a halt. Even the 8% growth in China is really a recession in the situation that exists in that country given the turbocharged growth of the economy in the last 10 to 15 years. What I want to underline here is that these are not just protests. Elemental outbursts of the working class. Yes, they are. But they catch it something far more serious. If one takes the medium and the long term. When Trotsky was speaking in 1938, he said, if you would have told me within 10 years we would be facing an objectively pre revolutionary situation, I would have considered that utopian. But on the basis of the slump, of the 1930s, of the mass movements of the working class, the question of revolution was posed in a number of countries. We're at the beginning, not just of a reawakening of the working class, but with the idea of social change, of a social revolution, will be put on the agenda, not just in Greece, but we have, in a sense, the elements of a pre-revolutionary situation today, but also in Britain, yes, sleepy Britain of the past, because the hammer blows of events will compel the most advanced first of all, and through them, the mass of the working class, to think out the problem first of all, to ponder what is happening, to search for alternatives, and they will beat a path to our door if we do it in the right way. And on the basis of that, also fashion and develop the subjective factor that can change the situation, a mass party and a mass working class. Yet having said that, the working class is, last, is least prepared. And by the way, in this process, let us not forget the part of what's happened in France, because what's happened in Ireland, what's happened in Greece, is that marvellous movement in Lindsay, which in a sense, like the overture to a symphony that contains all the elements of the symphony, but also in an undeveloped form. You had the elemental movement of the working class, but you also had the intervention in a small way, but quite decisive, of the subjective factor of the role of the Socialist Party, of the Yorkshire section of the Socialist Party, in conjunction with the industrial departments of our organization, that made all the differences in a victory on a defensive struggle. That has raised the prestige of this party to new heights in the eyes of many, even of the official sections of the labor movements in Britain. 
And yet that dispute, and I'll come to it later on, demonstrated that never before in history has there been a greater discrepancy between the objective development of events and the consciousness and the outlook, the understanding of the mass of the working people, and even to some extent, the advanced layers of the working class as well. That, of course, is because the working class is being unprepared by their leadership. In fact, the leadership of this movement, not just in Britain but internationally, is the most craven probably in history. Went over lock, stock and barrel to the capitalists from a world point of view. Adopted the so-called Washington Consensus of the program of neoliberalism. And after such a period of 30 years, let us remember, is it surprising that the understanding of the working class lags behind? But the most important factor is this, this consciousness can catch up in the next period. That's the basis, by the way, very suddenly, of the abrupt changes that take place in the consciousness of the working class. Even in our party, maybe in this room, there is perhaps not a full acceptance of the program or the perspectives we put forward in relation to the climate crisis. Maybe there is. I think it's inevitable. I mean, it might think, certainly workers think, this crisis is all <coughs> over. And some would say, well, okay, we accept your analysis, but what's the bottom line? Can capitalism re-establish a certain equilibrium? By the way, we have to say, that is not only right, but possible, that is likely. The question is, what kind of equilibrium? We cannot give a definite answer. From an arithmetical point of view, with time, dates, and so on, to give an indication of where this crisis is going. The stewards of the system, the campus themselves, have no idea of where it's going to end up. Well, how can we work out in detail exactly how the situation will develop. Well, we can make one general conclusion at this stage. There's no going back to the period of the 1990s and the earlier part of this decade. There's no going back to the economic fireworks for world capitalism in that period. Even if a recovery takes place, it will be anemic, and it will leave the battered, the battered, if you like, victims of the system in its wake, in the form of the suffering of the working class itself. The ups and downs of capitalism, and even during a recession or depression, you can have a small blip. You can have a recovery of the stock exchange. That took place in the 1930s. That does not denote a healthy body. I won't use the term I used last year for fear of making a mistake. It doesn't it indicate a healthy body, a healthy well, capitalism itself. This is not just one crisis, but what we face is a series of drawn out crises. And yet, if we're honest about it in Britain, there is even a feeling, despite the avalanche of facts and figures and the announcements of redundancies, a feeling maybe there's a little bit of a phony war. I would draw the analogy of a tsunami when I was in Sri Lanka. I spoke to comrades in Sri Lanka, spoke to our contacts, the fishermen who had been affected. One of the things they drove home was that in the course of the tsunami developing, just before it struck, there was an eerie drama. In fact, the wave went out and left fish wriggling on the beach. And then this huge wave came and wiped out everything in its path. That's the, the scenario 